Okay, so I see the red button. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, Senate Education, Thursday, the 27th of August, and still meeting remotely. So we have basically two things to do today. One is to catch up with uh, an issue that a couple of months back seemed uh, crucial, um, and we attempted to prepare some legislation, had uh, a disagreement with the House about what that should be, and eventually the decision was made at the leadership level to let the local elections play out, see how those budgetary situations shook out ultimately. And so that's what we're taking a look at today. Just a reminder that on the list that the pro tem sent out of bills that uh, are not necessarily must pass, but that are agreed to pass. This wasn't on it. That is districts without budgets. This was on an addendum at the bottom called undecided. Um, and so it's clearly no one's priority that we write legislation, but I wanted to look at the situation and determine whether there was need uh, in case the house is interested, because again, I am thinking that we would wait for legislation to come from the House first. So uh, with that said, Brad James um, from AOE is with us. And he's got up a, a little chart under the documents part of the website for today. So if you want to pull that up, it's headed districts with no budgets approved or budgets currently in reconsideration. And why don't you take it from there, Brad? Okay. Um, for the record, Brad James, Agency of Education. I think you all know me. Nice to see you all. Um, welcome back to the committee, <laughs> to the legislative session. Um, so I believe when we left back in June, there were, I want to say, 19 districts that did not have school district budgets at that point. They had not voted on them, nor or they had not approved them one way or the other. Um, we are now down to Eight. I did not print off a copy of this for me, so when Jeannie pulls it up, I can, I can walk you through it pretty easily and straightforward. And what, what you will see is you will see a list of the eight, maybe nine school districts that I do not have budget data for, although at, as, of, as of 25 minutes ago, I now have budget data for two of those because it was in our system. I just pulled it, had it pulled down for me. Um, but most of the districts ended up having votes that turned out to be successful. Um, on the list, when it, when it pops up, you will see that there, there are two of them, um, Slate Valley in, in the Fairhaven area and uh, South Burlington have voted their budgets. They, the voters approved their budgets. I believe they voted on August 11th. So mm -hmm. they're the 30 day reconsideration period. Um, then I, the, there are two districts on there that, um, that I now have the data for. One is Caledonia Cooperative Unified, un, remember it's one of the newer ones, you, Caledonia Cooperative Union Elementary School District up in Caledonia Central Supervisor Union. Their budget is now in. Um, and so I'm working on that tax rate right now when I'm done with you guys. Um, and also just in is Wyndham Northeast Union Elementary School District, another one of the newer ones. Um, they just they just got their budget is now in also so they'll all set tax rates for those towns. So what you'll see when you when this if if Jeannie can get this pulled up, um, or if you guys can see it, um, I I think we can all see it. Okay, I, yeah, I'm not I'm not seeing it. That's why I'm that's why I'm saying. Oh oh, so, I see. Um, that's why I wasn't sure if you guys are seeing it or not. So right, it, it, uh, it's okay that I don't see it. I I, okay. I know most of it. Um, the count obviously not it's eight or nine. Um, but um, but there are there's Buell's Gore on there. Buell's Gore is an unorganized well, it's a gore, um, and they they always get their stuff in late because they have a meeting usually at the end of August, and that's when their budget is finalized, um, and that will be sent in to us. Um, and then we're missing Oxbow, Oxbow Union High School um, has a has a uh, vote on September first. That's when they'll be okay. voting. If it passes, they go into their 30-day reconsideration period. And then we're, uh, I don't have any information on um, Granville, Hancock, Rochester, Stockbridge, and First Branch, which is 
Chelsea Tunbridge. Mm -hmm. I think it's Chelsea Tunbridge. Um, I don't have information on, on where they on where they stand um, because their business manager is on vacation this week. So as as, as soon as she comes back, or my guess is she'll check email at some point, and respond to me. I'll I'll send it to you guys so that you know what what where the stands. Okay. Is. So Brad, am I interpreting you correctly that there are, that there are then only three that we and maybe less that we really need to worry about? I, I would say probably four because I think Oxbow is one of them um, because okay. they haven't voted yet. But they have a vote scheduled. They have a vote scheduled. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. I'm sure. I'm, I imagine the other three do also. Um, they were they. I remember, if I recall correctly, they were a, a group of school districts that postponed their vote due to the, due to COVID, and they they were pushing it back, um, and, and so that people weren't coming in. So I'm I'm not sure what where they stand right now at this point. Okay, so, so I, th I think they're just four that, that that we haven't heard from really. Yep, and if they do have votes scheduled, we could conceivably in a few weeks' time be in a situation where everybody's got an approved budget, although they may not be out of the reconsideration period. Right. Correct. Uh, okay. So, so it's, it's moved forward fairly well. Yeah, that's, that's kind of when, when uh, Representative Webb and I had our meeting with the speaker and the pro tem, that was the argument that one of the arguments I was making was that it seemed as though we shouldn't step into these, um, you know, kind of friction-filled election scenarios that they would probably shake out all right. Um, I haven't heard any, uh, you know, any indication from the House that they're still interested in pursuing legislation on this. And we can ask the superintendents, uh, we do have a representative from them here, uh, Chelsea Myers. Um, Chelsea, would you be comfortable in a bit talking about that? Okay. Um, Ruth, you had a question? Uh, yeah, well, I just, uh, I had heard that Granville Hancock passed their budget. I believe they had a meeting this month. Okay. Um, so they may be off the list. And same with Buell's Gore. Those are both in my district, and I'm pretty sure they did. Um, and just a note for your, your data, um, Rochester Stockbridge, that's Windsor County, not Addison County. Oh, do I have that? that oh, yeah. That's my, that, thank you. Yeah. I, I actually so, know that. <laughs> yeah, I, I figured you did. My big file. <laughs> um, so we may be down to two because I'm pretty sure those have already passed. But I can, if if nobody knows, I can make some calls if you need me to. But I'm assuming you can make those same calls, Brad. <laughs> I, I can and I will. Um, I just I didn't I have not gotten in touch with Buell's Gore. Um, and and again, as I said, I didn't I didn't know about the Grandpa Hancock one. So. Yeah, so I I knew I knew they were voting somewhere. They had planned on voting somewhere around now, but I didn't know when it was. So, okay, um, and uh, Chelsea Myers, if I could ask you, so um, a while back, the superintendents favored legislation that would change the statute to reflect uh, a default scenario that would be. Um, including an inflator in the event that uh, a district didn't pass a budget on time. And then following that, the superintendent's position was that we should wait and see how things shook out. So any update on where your organization is now in terms of what it is looking for or not looking for? Yeah, we're really pleased that those districts that didn't have approved budgets for the most part have been able to pass budgets and um, really work through challenging circumstances. Um, I think we would like an opportunity to check touch base um, with those that don't have approved budgets now and I'm happy to do so and get back to you about those specific budgets in particular. Um, and how they're feeling about their upcoming uh, scheduled votes. So yeah, please okay. overall. Thank you, I'd appreciate that. Um, any questions for Brad James um, while we have him here? Okay, um, Brad, anything final you wanna add about this or anything else while you're here? 
Um, no, I, th I think I think that the that the budgets went more smooth than people anticipated. Um, I, I think I'm from all from all sides that I had heard from. Um, I know that that there I heard I did hear from South Burlington that some people were offended and surprised and shocked that they had another vote because they didn't think they could. And I said, well, yes, they have to have another vote. <laughs> Um, but outside of those things, I, I think it's all gone pretty well. Um, I have not heard rumblings from any of the towns that I that are the districts that don't have budgets yet, so I'm not sure where, where they stand. Um, and that's yeah. kind of all I have to say on, on that topic. If you want to talk about anything else, I'll be happy to, if, if I know anything else about it. Uh, well, um, the secretary is coming at 3.15 to talk about ADM, uh, and various other topics. I don't know if you can be here. Yeah, I, I was plan I was planning on being here to to listen in on that too. And okay, good. Your questions if necessary. Yeah, that that would be great. I'll just say about South Burlington. I I probably have spoken to the to the person you're talking about um, because there were a number of uh, people organizing the No campaign who yeah. were still of the opinion this last budget I think was uh, it was under two percent was something like 1.6 percent um, very very modest very lean budget at this point and um, it did it did pass but there were people who felt that any increase during the emergency was um, on its face an insult to the community so what what can you do yeah, um, and I, I, I think the vote result was fairly close. Um, so I yeah. wouldn't be shocked if there was a petition for reconsideration on that one. I, you know, speaking as an outsider, because I don't live in South Burlington, I hope not. I mean, they've already had three votes and all of those are conducted under the, you know, elaborate COVID procedures. So, right. you right. know, asking for a reconsideration seems, is there a threshold for a signature number? Um, yes, there is. Um, off the top of my head, I'm forgetting what it is. I want to say it's five percent of the registered voters, but, but it also yeah. changed. You, you could make it higher, or, or, or they had the, the ability that that price piece of statute was changed. But then, in order for a reconsideration vote to to win, they have to have a the, the no votes have to be a certain. I've forgotten off the top of my head the certain percentage. I should be able to find it quickly. A certain percentage of the yes, of, of more than the yes votes. It, it, okay. it changed, and I don't remember when it is. That's the all right. Top. Don't okay. don't bother yourself with it. Okay. I I knew there must be a, a rubric for it, but I just couldn't. There remember. There, there is something. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, you know, we'll we'll see what if, if it happens. I'll I'll let you know what what the answers need to be. All right. <laughs> so, um, committee, we we have, as I said before, we have an interval. Uh, where Secretary French couldn't join us um, until 3.15, which is about a half an hour from now. So unless anybody has a topic that they want to bring up in that time, I, Corey. You can finish what you're going to say, but I'll... I, I, I was just going to... Real quick. Go ahead. Uh, oh, you're frozen, Corey. Oops. There you are. You guys all there? Uh, we are, but we didn't hear what you said. Okay. Um, one of the uh, thought process I'd have, and I don't know if it comes up in this committee or in government um, uh, or in Jeanette's committee, you know, are we going to talk about vote by mail for the next school budgets next March and getting some of that system set in place? Because I think, you know, if we're going to have another, you know, potential another round of, of COVID issues and we're, we're talking about vote by mail being a way to increase voter participation. I think some of the lowest voter participation votes we have are our town meeting day. So, um, you know, is it, is it a concept you think that I, I think we should be bringing it up now and, and getting in place for March. Um, I think it'll give much more access to Vermonters to, to have yep. an input on their schools. It is, it is a good thought. I, I would imagine that I'm trying to remember the exact wording of what we passed. I think everything we passed with regard to voting is conditioned on the emergency. So mm -hmm. if, the, if the governor's executive order is still in place, then I think they can 
any municipality can automatically move to vote by mail. Anybody, anybody have a different read on where we are than that, Ruth? I, I seem to remember that it was in place for 2020 elections and that we might have to do something again if for 2021 if there's still the pandemic raging. But okay. I also seem to remember that when you were talking about the list that Secretary French was going to talk to us about today, one of the things was Australian ballot Australian requirement. Ballot. So it, it's possible that we could tackle it via that vehicle mm -hmm. if, if we all decide it's a good idea. But it, again, like Corey said, it may be something that Jeanette and GovOps would want to weigh in on. Yeah, it's it probably is. Even, even the Australian ballot piece, we'd have to send to Jeanette's committee um, because she's, she's very um, rightly uh, of the opinion that all voting issues are her, are her bailiwick. Um, yeah, I'm not, I, I just can't remember clearly if we, I mean, most of the emergency legislation we passed had a, a, a prefatory clause that said, during the state of emergency, blah, blah, blah. If we didn't do that on the voting changes, then we'd need to make a date change. Um, but I know now municipalities can send out ballots. Um, so I wouldn't imagine it would be that problematic, but I'll, I'll send Jeanette a, an email just um, laying out the Australian ballot um, provision that the secretary's promoting. And then I'll ask about, about town meeting day uh, school votes and see what her response is. Um, Jim, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I just pulled up the uh, act um, you passed um, and it says in section three, it is Act um, 92, Section 3, uh, I just lost it, I'll get back. Um, it says, um, in the year 2020, uh, the Secretary is authorized in consultation and agreement with the Governor uh, to order or permit um, appropriate election procedures for health and safety, et cetera, including uh, requiring mail, mail balloting by required uh, requiring mail balloting by requiring town clerks to send ballots by mail to all registered voters. So it's for 2020 and it's, it requires uh, basically coordination with the secretary and the governor. So I, I imagine the thinking there was that we'd be back in January and if we were still in a state of emergency, we could update it then, but- Well, I, my point is the yeah. secretary of state said we couldn't wait till now to make it uh, make that decision for the November election, so yep. can we really wait till January to make that decision for a March election? Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, so that's just my my point on it. Okay, um, Jim, could you could you send me the reference to that uh, to that yeah. specific, and I'll include that in the email to Jeanette, and I'll just ask her. We we amended that uh, though to take out the in consultation with the governor. Oh, yeah, so I, I think that's all. That was the only change, though. Yeah. Yeah. But we didn't. But Corey makes a good point about there being a uh, a time lag that we've delivered oh, yeah, definitely. that up for some reason. But Jeanette may have a, you know, an answer to that. They may have done something else or are planning something else. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, why don't we uh, just. Well, or, yeah, and I could give you an update on. Uh, oh yeah, go ahead. School air quality program. I had a meeting with EBT this morning, and they sent me some information based on the program. If you want to hear that now, yeah, please. So they have over three hundred schools. I think they said three hundred four schools, which is like three fourths of the eligible schools. So they said there's only about a hundred schools that they haven't had a contact with and had a walk through. So they have a scope of work set up with all these 300 schools, which I think that the pipeline, not all of them have the, a dollar amount for it, but the pipeline they have is over $7 million. So right now they can't, they don't have enough money of the 6.5 we appropriated to do all the work that they've scoped out so far. They're 
if they do the average uh, the, around forty thousand dollars has been around the average cost thirty to forty so if they extend that out to the other schools they're thinking that would be 12 million 12 to 18 million if all and if the 100 schools also joined in so basically the the program has been going well the one issue that they had thought would be an issue was as far as the workforce has not turned out to be as much of an issue as they had worried about that the hvac contractors have been able to bring folks back that they had furloughed and have really stepped up and they want to do this work and help the school. So that has not been proven to be a bottleneck. So they do feel that they could spend more money. And if you wanted to, we could we could have them in. And they have a program director who I spoke with who's, who's really good about, you know, she has experience working with the schools with EVT and she could describe how the how the program is going, how they're setting it all up and, and think like they could get to another $4 million or up to the $12 million total. Okay. Um, the other thing that occurs to me is in finance, when uh, we were hearing Mark Peralt, he was talking about two streams of money, CARES funding, which was conditioned on a December 30 deadline. And so they've developed this protocol where everybody's being asked to spend down CARES fund first. And then if, if CARES fund runs out or if the date is past the 30th, to use the other pot of money, ESSA money. Um, uh, yeah, Brad. Just, if I could just jump in for a quick clarification, that, that's essentially correct. When you say CARES Act money, there, there are two pots of money that we're really talking about here for the school districts. There's the ESSER money, which is education or elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund. That's the ESSER money. And that has a, that has a time limit up th through s September 30th, 2022. The money that you called CARES money is really CRF money. I get the confusion. Uh, Coronavirus Relief Fund. And that's the money that, that expires on December 30th of this year. They have to incur their costs by then. So that's what the money is that Efficiency Vermont is using. That's the money we're trying to get people to use first. If, if, if a cost can be used, if a cost can be covered by either ESSER or CRF, we want them to use the CRF money first because it, it's, it has a shorter time period and the ESSER yep. money has a broader broader set of uses. No, understood. I, I guess what I was saying is our, our whole thought pattern was built on this idea that uh, there were only so many contractors yeah. and that the work, because students would be in the building, it would be slow going. We'd only be able to do 6.5 million before the 30th of December, but seems like we might be able to set up a, a kind of contingency piece of legislation so that in as we spend down the the uh, CRF money mm -hmm. and we get to the 30th that we continue the program but just then feed in the ESSER money if if we could get the leadership and the administration to go along with that the, the, the one qualification there is the CARES Act. The CARES Act itself is very clear that the state has no say in how that money is used. You can make suggestions, but you can't tell the school districts how to use that money, how, how to use the ESSER money. That's, that's ah, very, I see. very clear. And so it, it, uh, it's in the form of a direct grant to the district. Yes, yes. Okay. It, um, it comes through us and then goes to the, to the districts. Okay, well, either way, I, I think there's the possibility of a need for more money, which is good, good news in a way. The more we can get done with these yeah. funds uh, on this infrastructure, the better. Uh, Senator Hardy. Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, Senator Parchlick a question. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you asked about, as Senator Bruce just alluded to or, or mentioned that, you know, now that students will be in the building soon, my understanding is they can't do the work while the students are actually in the building. Um, and uh, so that will delay it even more. So even if there are enough contractors, did they feel like there were enough days? Because I talked to one school district who you know, has been waiting to get the money so they can get their projects started. And now they're bringing students back in a week and a half. So now they're gonna be doing it on like weekends and vacation days and things like that. Um, but they're just worried they're not going to get the, it's going to take 
a long time because they can't do the work when the students are in the building. So did that come up in your conversation? It did not. We didn't talk about that directly. So I assume that they've been finding ways to either do it while they're in their building. It probably just depends on the project of what they can do when somebody's in the building, whether it's staff or students and what they'd have to do on weekends and nights. Uh, and But there are some schools that are doing the hybrid where there is days where there aren't kids in the schools. So maybe there's enough of those or there is the the Digger article about the school that said we would do in person, but for our HVAC system. So they're doing all remote. So there, there might be enough of those, but that would be something that I could clarify with them or they, if, if we have them in, they could talk about. Yeah, yeah I, I guess just when we get testimony, I, I think it's good testimony from them, but also maybe have the superintendents or somebody who's at the school side of things. So they're, so we understand how it's playing out on the school side too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's sad to have a district that can't have students back because of the HVAC. Um, I, I know that we didn't put any criterion in for uh, efficiency Vermont to prioritize according to need, um, but if there's a way to get them worked on in the early days, that would be better. Um, so I, I'll I'll just uh, you know have it in my mind that we might be looking, because we're gonna be asked to develop some budgetary recommendations, kind of the way we did last time. Uh, and so if Efficiency of Vermont is now of the thinking that they might be able to do up to 12 million, um, I'd like to make sure that we put, put our hand out quickly uh, because the money, the $100 million that we uh, fenced off, the uh, the administration is sort of choosing to pretend like we didn't, and so effectively there's a an argument being set up over that money, and so it seems to me impossible to turn down a need like this. So, but I will keep that in mind. Um, any anything else before we take a break and wait for Secretary French, Ruth? Yeah, I mean, this I I see Jay here, so I'm wondering, can I ask Jay a question? Um, Absolutely, he he will be testifying, but feel feel free. Okay, okay, and maybe Jay, you're going to cover this in your testimony. But I've been hearing, and I, I believe you've been working on the protocols for uh, school athletics, and I've heard from a few parents, not a huge amount, but a few that are really worried about school athletics and would prefer that we not do it this fall. So I'm wondering if that would be what you're looking to do and, and sort of updating where uh, school sports stand. Sure, <clears throat> in terms of my testimony, we actually have joint testimony together today, Senator Baruf and Chelsea will be delivering that and uh, anybody else that can join us will just be there to answer any questions. In terms of the sports piece, um, if we can't have sports in Vermont, nobody can. Um, you know, we've got mitigation, mitigation strategies that are very scientifically sound. We've worked with the state epidemiologist, uh, commissioner of health, as well as Dr. Lee and Dr. Raska to come up with a plan that we think is, is very safe. Um, we've had plans this summer, recreational plans that are not nearly as safe as what we're proposing for the fall. and We have not had outbreaks. So our feeling is if, if we can have kids go back to school, and if we can have safe mitigation strategies for them to um, engage in extracurricular activities, not just sports, then we should do everything we can to make that happen. All students, coaches, uh, officials will be masked at all sports except for cross country. Cross country, there'll be staggered starts, uh, which will help so that kids are not breathing on each other. Football, we're going from a 11 on 11 tackle football to a seven on seven no tackle. Uh, football. We're taking a lot of negative heat on that, but it's the right thing to do in terms of safety. And Dr. Lee and Dr. Raska have been with us at every meeting to talking about how we're going to do sports in a way that's safe. And I can answer any specific questions you have, Senator Hardy, but that's that's kind of the gist of it. Are, are you doing any yeah. indoor sports or are they all outdoor? So for the fall, we are doing uh, the only indoor sport that we have in the fall is volleyball. And so what the volleyball committee, and we were told we're not, we're not going to have volleyball 
uh, games because in the safe and healthy schools guidance document that's guiding the reopening of schools and full disclosure I was one of the authors of that we made it clear in there that they could not have visitors from other schools so that means that we could not have volleyball in the school so volleyball can have practices inside with masking but if they have interscholastic competition against other schools they'll have to do that outside so we won't have a volleyball championship this year it'll look a lot different but at least the kids will be able to have the volleyball experience and activity with their teammates. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a question, Brad, uh, and I can ask the secretary if you don't know, but um, in, terms of, in terms of the money, well, and maybe it's outside your purview, but we had um, put in for money for uh, independent colleges to test students when they come back? Um, and is there any money for K through 12 that's specifically earmarked around testing for districts? I, I, had, a, I had a business manager ask me that question as they're, as they're filling out their application for the CRF funds. And I, I believe you all know that the agency of administration has contracted with a consulting group called Guidehouse to provide expertise and guidance on what things can be used for. And what they're saying is that testing can be, it, it, is, it is covered by the CRF funds, um, but it's also covered by FEMA. Um, and so they, so again, if we're talking a hierarchy, hierarchy of how you want to use your money, you would want to use FEMA first, then CRF, then ESSER monies. Um, so that's just, that's information that's kind of coming out now that we heard about. So I, I believe that, that that will be an eligible cost for FEMA um, coverage. And that um, would be reimbursement. Yeah. And, and, and if, and if not, it's, it's covered, it is covered by CRF money. Just curious if, if a district decided not to say they would, but they decided we're going to test all students once a week. Um, what if FEMA then says, well, that's way too much. You shouldn't have spent that much. Do they have specific guidance that they've put out in terms of what you could spend on testing? Not, not that I have seen. Um, again, FEMA is guidehouse is, is is dealing with FEMA more directly. We we kind of talk to guidehouse and the agency of administration um, when we have questions, and they they check. I believe some of them have contacts with FEMA. I have not seen much information from FEMA. My understanding from talking to Guidehouse is that this is all new for FEMA also. They've never dealt with a pandemic before. They deal with hurricanes, fires, and things like that. Um, so this is new for them. And so it's somewhat unclear as to what costs will be covered. Um, there apparently are 10 different FEMA regions within the country. And some are able to get some stuff covered and some cannot get that same stuff covered. So it's I'm, it's, yeah. I, I, I don't know why, I don't know how to answer the question really outside yeah. telling what's going on that I, as far as I know. Um, well, but I, I, have, I, I, th I think if they do it, um, then it will be covered hopefully by FEMA. If not, it'll be covered by CRO. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I, I, I don't, at this point, I don't trust the, you know, the equity of the federal government because mm -hmm. President Trump is very clear that blue states do not enjoy his favor. And, you know, he will say in the middle of wild, wildfires in California, we're going to cut off your money. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's a flood in Texas, then he immediately rushes to say everything will be paid for. Don't worry about a thing. So I, I do worry about districts incurring costs and then being told later whether they're eligible. Right. Um, but testing is something we absolutely need to be um, on one page about and clear about and managing. Yeah, Ruth. Yeah, and on top of that, I mean, I share your concerns. Um, and uh, on top of that, I think the CDC has now changed their testing recommendations to not recommend any tests for asymptomatic people. So that would preclude any testing for school districts unless there's an outbreak, which, is quite frankly just irresponsible. So it's yeah. unlikely that they're gonna that they're gonna pay for testing unless there's an outbreak, and then it would be done by the state, I would assume. 
Yeah, I, yeah. I, believe, I believe the state guidance has not changed yet um, because there was some, I, I don't know if I want to call it an out in, in the CDC revisions that said, unless a state chooses to do something else, I'd have to go back and find that email. But it sounded to me like Vermont is not changing how we're, how we're approaching things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we should get more information on that because it sounds like the rhetoric has changed a little bit from what I've been hearing from our Department of Health that they are backing off on the asymptomatic testing. So I, this is way outside your purview, Brad, but it might be helpful for us to get a briefing again about testing. Yeah, um, I did not do that. I, I was just, I, it is, So this, this is from the uh, Division of the Department of Health um, sent this out to everybody uh, yesterday um, at 822. And it says, if, you, if I'm gonna read it to you, it says, um, it says CDC testing guideline change does not alter Vermont requirements. On Monday, the CDC and prevention changed its testing guidance to say that people who are asymptomatic may not need to be tested even if they have been in close contact within six feet of a person with a COVID-19 infection for at least 15 minutes, unless state or local public health officials recommend you take one. And then it goes on to say, that, that was the CDC part. Then it, Vermont goes on to say, Vermont guidelines and recommendation, recommendations for who should get tested are not changing at this time. The health department continues to recommend tests for people with symptoms, people who had close contact within 16, within six feet for 15 minutes, for about 15 minutes or more with someone who tested positive and people who are referred by the health care provider. So it sounds like Vermont hasn't changed a significant amount yet, but you may be right. It, it may be subject to change, but that's yeah. what we received yesterday, even, uh, last night. Yeah. And I mean, this is the same problem we confronted in uh, judiciary with corrections. Um, there was a disagreement at the beginning of the emergency about whether or not they should just test all the prisoners, which was the approach I favored, or wait until there were outbreaks. And, you know, our prisoner population is so small, 1,400 people, we could, we could test them all for a relatively small price tag and know right away what the situation is. Obviously, we have a lot more students than that, but there are certain counties, certain districts that are at greater risk than others at this point. Right. So I would think that, you know, for instance, Burlington High School, um, parents would not be, I, I think, uh, delighted at the idea of testing their kids, but I think they would prefer it to never testing their the, the population of the school. So, um, yeah, maybe that's something that we can get a little more um, information on from the secretary when he comes in in a minute. Um, any anything else? We're we don't really have time to take a break now. Um, it's uh, or maybe a maybe a five minute break. So everybody want to come back at three fifteen and uh, theoretically theoretically secretary French will be here. Um, so what did I see in five minutes? So I think we have Secretary French coming in. There he is. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Uh, so we, we were just on a minor break. Looks like we've got everybody back now. So um, as uh, we mentioned earlier, the secretary's mostly here to talk about uh, some, uh, a handful of small bore changes in statute that um, would help during the emergency. And I think we have that under the documents page. So um, 
So, Mr. Secretary, I'm hoping you can uh, discuss these pieces um, and help us understand the way you see them, and then also make a few comments on the summer nutrition report that you sent us. And then before you leave, I have an issue from Senator Starr with regard to Lemington, um, which is, uh, I've, I've sworn that I will uh, ask for your help on. So why don't we start with the COVID-19 near-term education policy proposal sheet. And if everybody's got that up, uh, begin when, whenever and wherever you like. Uh, sure, good afternoon, Dan French, Secretary of Education. Um, <clears throat> so what I had shared out with uh, Senator Bruth, uh, these were some policy ideas that as we've uh, engaging with our uh, emergency response with districts, uh, made the observation um, of some ideas that should be, I think, considered uh, before you adjourn for the General Assembly adjourns this year. Um, and they're, I would say, the chair characterized a small bore. I would agree that these are just very targeted uh, issues that have emerged uh, relative to enacting um, the emergency response. So I'll just take them one at a time and pause after each one if there's any questions. The first one has to do with uh, modifying statutory language around the minimum number of student days and minimum number of teacher and service days statute requires that school district calendars have at least 175 student days and five teacher and service days. Um, I think there is an interest on the part of the districts and it's one I support of modifying those minimums for this year only mm -hmm. so that there are 170 student days, but to transfer uh, those five days to the number of teacher and service days so there's more time for um, teacher and service planning and so forth to respond to the emergency. Mm -hmm. That seems it seems like we're we're already there given that September 8th is now the start date um, so this is really just bringing us into alignment with reality uh, yeah to a certain extent I mean with the September 8th we essentially pushed the whole calendar off mm -hmm. uh, but we also you know to get further into the weeds on the statute but the statute also has regional school calendars so the superintendents in each region are required to establish a regional school calendar by April 1st of the prior year. That's certainly been disrupted with the governor's emergency order. Um, so if we have this issue of sort of bringing that into uh, alignment, but the, 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 the specific need around increasing the number of teacher days available uh, would one, I think that would be welcomed by, by most, most districts. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see any questions there, so let's go on to ADM. So the issue of ADM, uh, we have several things happening uh, right now that would point to the need to introduce some stability in this regard. Uh, one being uh, there's been a record increase in the number of home study uh, students. Uh, so we're basically seeing at least 100% increase in that over last year. Uh, home study students are uh, not counted as resident pupils for the purpose of ADM, meaning the districts then uh, could stand to lose uh, some basic pupil count in terms of their funding formula, which could lead to an increase in taxes. Um, to a lesser extent, we're seeing um, new students move into the state perhaps, so there's, there's just a lot of uncertainty, and as you know, the budgeting process will be very challenging this year to say the least. Uh, so the rationale here, uh, or firstly, the suggestion is that uh, we freeze essentially ADM to be at least as the amount that they had last year. Um, and the, the goal here would have produced uh, at least one, one to isolate one variable in the very complicated budgeting process and introduce some stability into that uh, to provide um, you know, some assurance that districts would at least be able to navigate that now uh, it would be helpful going into the budgeting process. Mm -hmm. I know uh, I don't have a question, just a comment. In speaking with uh, Chairwoman Webb, she seemed to think this was something that should be held over until January, as though it were part of a broader discussion that would take a lot of testimony. Just doesn't strike me that way. Um, have you heard from her what, what her rationale is or is she still of that frame of mind? I have not had any conversation with her uh, on this topic. Um, I guess I'd, I'd, and I'd ask for Brad to ch check me on this, but 
uh, from my perspective, I, I think January would be too late. And we're going to ADM factors into the calculation of equalized pupils, and mm -hmm. that starts to be frozen sometime around December 15. So um, the, the, the objective here would be not only mechanically to stabilize the number, but also to influence people's behavior as part of the budgeting process. So to provide that assurance now influences behavior going into the budgeting process, which will start here in a matter of weeks. Uh, to leave it as an open question through January and possibly February or March uh, really doesn't begin to address the issue in my view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, agreed. Brad? I, I was just going to say, I completely agree with what Secretary Friends just said. This would, this would remove one big concern from people as they're trying to develop their budgets and what's going to happen down the road. Um, yeah. Especially for allowing districts that are seeing people moving in to have a greater count. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, like I say, it, it makes perfect sense to me and it doesn't seem to have a lot of moving parts that would need a lot of thinking about. Um, okay, let's go on to the waiver of online teaching endorsement. Yeah, this is a similar theme of stability. Uh, the, as you know, licensing regulations are um, controlled by the Vermont Standards Board. Uh, they've been amenable to uh, addressing this issue through their own action and uh, remain open to the idea. Uh, but the question would be, uh, could school districts benefit from uh, having greater, greater certainty around this issue now? And uh, so that's, that's why I'm bringing it forward. Uh, so what this would do uh, would, once again, on a temporary basis, require that district teachers not be required to hold a specific and teaching endorsement to teach online. Uh, we think this is especially important considering a lot of districts for the first time are standing up virtual learning academies. Uh, mm -hmm. That is going to require some more broad provisioning of online services than ever before. Uh, the Standards Board uh, has been expressed interest in continuing to support the waiver, but they're not necessarily interested in supporting a waiver for teachers teaching in the online virtual academies, because um, that sounds, I think, to them a little more permanent, and uh, therefore those teachers should have that expertise. Uh, but I think from what I've heard from superintendents, they would prefer to have some assurance now um, that this would be uh, the condition that they would not have to have that, teachers would not have to have that endorsement. Um, and would alleviate uh, a significant area of pressure that districts are under right now relative to staffing uh, during the pandemic. And, and this would be specifically framed as while the emergency is in place. That's correct. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, Ruth. Yeah, I just uh, thank you. Wanted to ask Secretary French a question about this. So I, I want to make sure I understand it. So there's a specific endorsement that is required for teachers to be able to be to teach classes online. And so this would remove it for this school year so that teachers, any teacher can teach remotely, teach students remotely if necessary during either part-time or full-time, is that right? That's correct. They'd still be required to have their subject area license, uh, but they wouldn't need the additional license to teach on the online platform. Basically, okay. they wouldn't, wouldn't have to go through a process to learn to teach online. Uh, they'd be allowed to do that. Okay. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that there wasn't a little bit more professional development over the summer about online teaching, because you can do it well and you can do it not so well. So, um, but, uh, this just, I just wanted to know, are there, I'm assuming since you didn't recommend it, but just wanted to ask, are there other licensing issues that may be coming up because of staffing shortages? Is there something else that we might be considering? Yeah, might I think consider? that's, that's a bigger question. Um, and, you know, to this, in the spirit of just trying to stay focused on sort of the small bore issues, I think that's a larger bore issue. Uh, and we've been very cautious about pursuing a waiver of regulation that should otherwise work through a more deliberative process. Uh, but to your earlier statement, yes, there's, I've taught online myself and there's, um, we've, there was a lot of professional development offered this summer to do that, but this online endorsement actually takes quite a bit of coursework to do. So it's not a, it's not something that can be achieved over the summer. It's, it's, it's a rather lengthy process. Um, but yeah, there, I think it's too early to contemplate waivers of licensing regulations. Uh, 
you know, we don't know the patterns yet of how that'll emerge. And I'm, I'm still, I think we err on the side of maintaining our quality uh, and uh, see how this plays out for a bit. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, that makes sense. I just have heard of, of schools struggling to find teachers because teachers retiring or whatever. So yeah. yeah, and we do have an emergency license provision already on the table. So we have we have some already in our regulations, the ability of districts to approach an emergency situation or a provisional situation. Uh, so I think we have some flexibility there that perhaps isn't the same in other states. Okay, so thank you. Maybe, maybe this is a good moment to introduce the issue that Senator Starr brought up. He has in Lemington and other uh, areas that border New Hampshire. They send students over the border to, to New Hampshire schools and New Hampshire schools apparently have an online platform called VLACS, VLAX, um, and New Hampshire as a, as a state is picking up the costs for that during the emergency, but these students are not having their attendance in that picked up because they're Vermont residents. Um, and so the, the person who was writing this felt caught between two worlds. And it seemed to me like the sort of expense that we could easily um, classify under CRF funding. So my, my question first is, has this come to your awareness? Uh, and, and if not, can I send the email to you? And does it sound like something you might be able to uh, find a solution for? Oh, you're muted, Secretary. Uh, it has not come to my attention. And I will say this is one of my old school districts. I was superintendent for Lemington, so I'm very familiar oh. with the community. Okay. Uh, they, they pay tuition uh, for their students. They do not operate any schools at all. And they also have um, special dispensation and statute to tuition their elementary students in New Hampshire as well. They're part of that border group that's mentioned mm -hmm. in statute. So I'd be happy to review it. It's not come to my attention. I do speak with the superintendent up there regularly. So my first thinking would be, why aren't they covering those costs for their regular tuition dollars that they pay for the education yeah. of students so they don't operate their you know, schools? Uh, but I'd be happy to take a look at it. Okay, I will, I will send it on to you. It's good to know you were employed in that district so you'll you'll understand immediately what they're talking about yeah um, okay let's go on then to requiring the use of Australian ballot we had some discussion earlier before you joined us uh, Senator Parent brought up the question of uh, universal mail ballots for town meeting day in the coming year which so far as we can figure out we're we're not set up to do because the change that we made in statute was dated 2020. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious, does this uh, reflect part of the thinking for town meeting day next year? And if so, are you already thinking about the universal ballot, mail, mail ballot? Oh, you're muted again. This is offered in that concept of how people are going to access town meeting, particularly when there's floor votes. Yep. Uh, so just to recap, the um, voters control the voting methodology, if you will. So voters decide whether they want to have a floor vote or Australian ballot. Um, in order to change the methodology, they have to vote first in their current methodology. So if voters wanted to change to Australian ballot for COVID-19 for town meeting in March, they would first have to hold a floor vote and vote to shift to Australian ballot. So we saw that as problematic, uh, and this is introduced to essentially require Australian ballot for this year. Um, so it would alleviate districts who currently have a floor vote. Um, By this would alleviate year, you, I'm sorry, do you mean by this year, you mean including 2021? Yes, this school okay. year. So it would be okay. during the COVID emergency. It would, uh, you know, so districts essentially would, if they if they found a floor vote to be problematic, and and I would argue they are in this context, uh, the Australian ballot would be utilized, and it wouldn't require them to first change their voting methodology, which would be very difficult in the COVID emergency. 
and we think with the Australian ballot, then people can then request absentee ballots more readily, but they at least have full access to um, the town meeting information, including school budget votes. Mm -hmm. I think, and uh, Jim, maybe you can check me on this, but I think we made this change for 2020. Isn't mm -hmm. that what was in the statute that you read, Jim? Yeah, so the statute that I, sent, I read to you earlier, um, let me just find it again for you. Um, make sure I'm correct. I know, I know the change was made to allow Australian ballot without a town meeting to allow it. Right, so this was section three of Act 92 and was amended as you mentioned, uh, Senator Bruce. Um, but I believe it says in the year, yeah, it says in the year 2020, so the entire year, uh, I guess the governor now uh, is allowed to um, uh, change appropriate election procedures to protect health, including requiring, oh, that's no, I'm about, about sorry. Um, oh, sorry, it's turned about to later on. We, we talked about mail about, about before, Sam Bruce. Um, the Australian ballot, uh, section four sa says that voters, uh, notwithstanding law that requires voters of a municipality to vote to apply the provisions of the Australian ballot uh, to an annual special meeting. Uh, in the year 2020, any mis municipality shall may apply the Australian ballot system to any or all of its municipal elections held in the year 2020 by vote of the of its legislative body. So that's. Okay. Need that it can be done by the board, uh, school board, as opposed to going to voters. Okay, so um, this this uh, makes perfect sense to me. It's in line with what we already did. It's just updating it to go further in time. Um, so what I said earlier about mail in ballot, I'll just extend to this. I'll I'll begin a conversation with Jeanette White um, and find out what the government operations committee intends because they did put a specific date of 2020, which I assume was meant to leave them the option in 20 January of 2021 of extending it. But as we've said a couple of times now, why wait um, and have a gap in people's understanding of what the procedure is? So um, I can talk with her about the Australian ballot issue and the mail-in ballot issue at the same time. Any questions for the secretary on any of those five, I think it was five uh, mm -hmm. pieces or four pieces. We, we uh, also, Jim found language that he prepared around the transportation grant issue. Do you remember that Mr. Secretary? I'm um, familiar with the program, but I'd well, you just, refresh just similarly to prevent a corruption of the of the numbers because of the pandemic. And so Jim just oh. fished, fished out the old language that he had done. So my thought was that we could add that to these pieces because it's a, a very similar thing, just making sure that people aren't disadvantaged because the statute calls for the number of students that they delivered rather than during the pandemic delivering meals along the same corridor. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, uh, I invite Brad to chime in, but my understanding is the transportation reimbursement is based on the prior year's expenditure. So what happened this spring won't be getting to them until the following year. But then it, they, would, it would corrupt the numbers later on, right? Yeah, my caveat would be provided they don't access CRF or other sources to cover that difference. So they might they might have um, a commensurate reduction in expenditures, you know, that are allowable for reimbursement. They might have the cost, which would be to your point about the reimbursement, but they also then might have some new ability to justify reimbursement under CRF or ESSER to cover those costs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. While I'm thinking about it, um, we were talking about the HVAC grant program and apparently Efficiency Vermont, Senator Perchlick was telling us they now believe they may be able to complete more than 
5 million up to 12 million perhaps. And I started thinking of the ESSER money because the problem with the CRF money was that the work had to be completed by December 30. What would you think about uh, a piece of budgetary language that directed that following uh, December 30th, uh, a chunk of money from ESSER could be used to continue that program? Yeah, I, I defer to Brad. Brad's got the expertise on this. I don't, first, my first flag would be, I'm not sure we can direct how ESSER is utilized. Oh, uh, right, right. That's I got correct. that. Yeah, but they certainly could use it, I believe, and that's where I'll see Brad's head now. I mean, if they have HVAC costs that are qualified, they could use ESSER funds to address those issues. But we can't direct them to do that. Right, right, right. okay. Yeah, Ruth. I, I just following up on that. The, the ESSER funds and this the, is the ESSER funds above the um, spending cap or below it? Does it? It's federal, so it would, it's not included in the spending threshold calculation. Oh, in, correct. In terms of education spending, yeah, yeah, it's an interesting question. I would think. Um, and I keep inviting Brad to correct me here. So. Uh, you know, if they have, you know, if you figure, you know, with a budget, you have expenditures and then local revenues, which would be any other way a district could spend or cover their costs other than relying on the ed fund. If they had an expenditure on HVAC and an offsetting revenue from ESSER, they would wash each other out and therefore not impact their aggregate education spending. I guess mm -hmm. the question would be what fiscal years that happens and conceivably a district could spend money in November to fix HVAC and then not get reimbursement on or use their ESSER one way or the other. Um, right. But theoretically, the two I th would think would wash at some point if they're smart about it. <laughs> I'll say smart Is about it. Is that also it's, true it, for the CRF money, Brad? It, for, for things out for things outside the budget, yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So they're gonna they're gonna show in their budgets any revenues coming and they have to under you know the law. So they'll they'll show those revenues coming in. Um, but it's it is it's a question of how to do that in the same fiscal year, I guess. You know, right. But it's not counted as part of education spending yeah. because it's federal funding. Right. It, okay. Because it, it's it's cover it's covering a cost. So as, as Secretary Friend said, it's a wash. It, it's it's right. Because this is a question I've gotten from superintendents. So hopefully, yeah. when you I don't know yeah. if you give them just to be careful that. to be careful in the question. I think it is legitimate education spending. It does count as education spending, but it would be offset by revenues, you know? That's, that's right. I, I agree with yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Mr. Secretary, if we could ask you to speak just a little to the summer nutrition report, which is also up on our page. Okay. Yeah, so we, um, as required, we provided um, a summary of the, the summer meal uh, delivery. Um, it's the report, I don't see your page, but it's dated August 19th. Um, happy to go into this in more detail. And certainly, I think you're familiar with Rosie Kruger, um, our excellent person on this. We, um, I think the summary point I'd make is that uh, with the CRF, the legislature, um, I believe, appropriated about $12 million uh, for reimbursement. And uh, we've received about $2.2 in claims for that. Um, for a variety of reasons, uh, but um, we have some recommendations of that um, in terms of how, how to continue to support these programs, allowing the funds to be used for early September prior to school reopening. I will say we've subsequently received, uh, or say everyone's received national waivers uh, to extend uh, the summer eligibility or the summer flexibility into when school starts. Um, also to allow funds to be used for uh, nutrition costs incurred by schools uh, to provide meals to children once the school year starts and consider using uh, the funds to address solvency issues for meal programs um, who are involved in universal meals. So we have some other ideas, um, but that's, you know, a summary to date uh, and certainly the issue of, you know, what was appropriated versus what was uh, accessed in terms of a reimbursement request is interesting. Um, in terms of CRF, uh, but you know these programs have been running nonstop essentially uh, through through the beginning of the response. Um, 
And I know districts are going to have increased demands, particularly in the implementation of hybrid learning presents a whole new set of challenges for these programs because they're um, basically running, in some cases, three different kinds of meal programs at the same time. They might be doing grab and go for remote learning students or delivering meals while at the same time provisioning meals for in-person students in their buildings. Mm -hmm. Questions? I, I have one question, which is, um, the, the $50 million that we appropriated, which included, I believe, this $12 million. Yes. Um, the, the, the large frame for this is concern from, uh, and we have uh, superintendents and principals here, um, concern from them about the $100 million that the legislature had, um, quote unquote, fenced off for K through 12. And in my memory, that was always attached to hopefully getting the flexibility to fill the ed fund gap. But over and above that, there was understood to be a chunk of money that would be left from the 100 million that would be added to the 50 million that would cover reopening costs and not leave anybody out in the cold for those sorts of things. Can you just speak generally to, it seems as though there's a chunk of money that will go unspent from this program. Am I assuming right that you'll just continue the timeline out for nutrition and continue spending that 12 million? That's one question. Then the next question is, is, is it also your understanding that um, money over and above the 50 million will be necessary to feed into what we've already appropriated for K through 12 now that we're reopening? Yeah, there, the issue of the 100 million, the 50 million, I think, you know, just to back up on our, when we made a proposal to the legislature for reopening costs under CRF, it was approximately the 50 million. We used uh, the national, you know, it's a guess, you know, no one knew what reopening costs would be. And we used uh, the model that was produced by the American Association of School Administrators and their sister organization, the school, the National School Business Officials, the Business Managers Association. And they created a model that worked out to about $490 per pupil. Uh, you know, we used that and $50 million is, is, you know, slightly more than that, but that's the general ballpark. And that include, and their model included things like childcare before and after school childcare, a lot of things, you know, that we could say are not or part of the reimbursement process. And certainly HVAC, um, you know, the HVAC's a big can of worms, I think, and a lot of it gets into our deferred maintenance issues in the state, you know, that go back pre-day COVID and so forth. So it's, you know, really what we have from a logic perspective is this hypothesis of what costs would be. And we adopted more or less that model, I think, to our credit. Uh, but then what are the real costs and waiting for more factual information to answer sort of your second question about will additional costs exist? I know, I know there are additional costs related to COVID. The question of are they related to reopening or not? To what extent? I often equate CRF with reopening just because of its reimbursement nature and the fact that it has a very compressed timeline. But that is just my assumption. That's not necessarily CRF could be, you know, used through the fall. Um, but I think, you know, for the moment, I, I, my impression is that districts have been able to manage cash flow. Uh, you know, they have yet to really start to draw down these funds or ESSER funds. I mean, we were looking at the ESSER, I invite Brad to run on the numbers here, but a large, most districts have started their ESSER application. The ESSER application has been available in July, uh, but I think only two have actually submitted their application. So, you know, we have that issue out there. We have, there's cash flow. I only know one district this summer that had cash flow issues. They usually contact us when they run into that scenario. So I think districts are managing reopening costs, but I would argue they also have the expectation of seeing things reimbursed. And as we get closer to the budget process, they're, they're going to get anxious about seeing these new costs manifest themselves into a tax increase for voters and get caught in that very difficult position. Like we were told to make these investments, but now we're saying we're going to pay for it out of the property tax bill. So I think uh, right now, my, my inclination is to say, and certainly looking at the reimbursement for the food service programs to say there's adequate funding on the table to reopen schools with a caveat about HVAC, you know, HVAC, I think depending on how we qualify those expenses, 
uh, I trust efficiencies of Vermont's diagnosis to sort of corral that. If they're saying it's 12 million instead of 6.5, I think they have some log logic to sort of confine that because that number could be much, much higher if they open that up uh, mm -hmm. to a broader definition. Uh, but, you know, absent other information from districts, it's hard to say at this point uh, if 50 million is not sufficient. So I would say I think right now it is. Um, well, in terms of one, one question just to clarify my again my memory could be faulty but i thought that the 50 million also was going to reimburse expenses that had already been occurred incurred so in other words there was about 12 million as i remember that had already been uh coded to covid 19 in districts around the state and the 50 million included that if that's the case then it isn't 50 million it's 38 million uh, with 12 of that for nutrition. So now you're down to 26 remaining. Is that correct? Well, I, I don't do the math that way. Like I said, I in our proposal, we were looking at sort of the national model about reopening. It didn't say food service is not part of reopening or childcare is not part of reopening. It sort of, it was a general model of here's what we're mm -hmm. gonna put on the table. Um, and maybe Brad can speak to the retroactive piece a little more fluently than I can. Brad, do you do you have a recollection of how the retroactivity piece was going to play out? Yeah, yes, I do, because um, I was part of those discussions towards the end of the session or the first part of the session. Um, Senator, Senator Ruth, you're correct that that part of that CRF money is intended to 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 pay for some of the costs that were incurred back in FY20. Um, and, and that last three, three, four months, whatever it was, um, with a large part of that hope being that, that some of those costs that they that they could be reimbursed for would be um, co eligible costs that were in their budget, and that money would roll forward into FY21 and help offset the education fund deficit. Additionally, though, a lot of they, they did incur costs um, in, in, in the end of FY20 that were not in their budget. And so CRF is a true reimbursement at that point, making them whole again. So, but, but you're correct, there, there's money there. And, our, and I believe our last estimate was around, around $12 million. Um, hopefully in a couple of weeks, we'll have a better idea of what that number really is for FY20. Okay. Um, so if, if you don't mind, Mr. Secretary, I'd, I'd like to just allow, uh, Jay Nichols and Chelsea Myers, if, if they want to comment on that piece, because a letter went out, as you know, undersigned by all of these organizations with concerns about the 100 million. Um, Jay, w anything you'd like to um, ask or add? Uh, I'll just say briefly that <clears throat> we've been telling principals from day one and, and superintendents as well, to spend what they need to be able to reopen safely. And we've been planning on overall, the number we've been talking about is 100 million with the hope that if there's money left over, that there'll be federal uh, flexibility to allow for some of that money to backfill the ed fund to address the gap in the ed fund. So that's what we've been telling people since, since uh, last year. Of Chelsea, if you wanna add anything to that or not. No, I... It's a significant part of our testimony today. I don't know if you want us to start or just, um, I agree with Jay's comments that we, superintendents are under the impression that they were to do what it takes to reopen schools safely. Um, so that's the mindset that they've been approaching this with. Yeah, and I, I believe um, the secretary's finished with his testimony. So, um, and did I understand you right, Jay, that you have a uh, joint testimony today that one of you will deliver? Yeah, Chelsea is going to deliver a testimony for the superintendents, school boards, business managers, Vermont Council, special educators, and the principals. Okay, let's go to that then. Yeah, uh, I don't know if Jeff or Jay, sorry, said this, but VASBO is also included on this. Um, so just for the record, since I haven't been here too often, um, my name is Chelsea Myers and I'm the Associate Executive Director of the Vermont Superintendents Association. So thank you for having us here today. Um, as you know, school boards and administrators have been working tirelessly to responsibly navigate the safe reopening of schools on September 8th. 
This includes contending with evolving health and safety guidance, which has changed a number of times, competing concerns from family, staff, and community members, operational and logistical challenges, and the significant academic, developmental, and social needs of the students they serve, perhaps the most important part. At this time, we have recommendations for your committee to consider to ensure school districts have the financial stability and support to safely reopen schools in September and to address other issues facing public education. As mentioned by Secretary French, our associations support the idea um, in light of the governor's order to delay the opening of school until September 8th that um, the required 175 student days set forth in 16 VSA be reduced to 170 days. This modification will relieve districts from the obligation to find ways to make up the five days that would have been fulfilled had school started as originally scheduled. Um, and again, perhaps most pressing is the question of the additional coronavirus relief funds fenced off by the General Assembly to help K through 12 schools with the cost of reopening during the pandemic and to address a deficit in the education fund. The governor's budget does not include money to help schools deal with reopening costs amid the COVID-19 crisis. If the federal coronavirus relief funds are not used to pay for these unbudgeted costs of reopening schools, districts will be operating in a deficit, which will need to be addressed in the following year's budget, leading to a spike in property taxes and potentially drastic cuts to spending at a time when students will need additional academic, social, and emotional support. VSA has begun to collect information regarding the costs associated with reopening schools. And we did this ahead of the CRF application, which was just released on last Friday evening. It is becoming clear that the estimates will likely exceed the original allocation for reimbursement, though more information needs to be collected. Um, as you can imagine, superintendents and their business managers are quite busy um, with the approaching start of school. Furthermore, many business managers and superintendents have reported uncertainty about what is considered an allowable cost. This may in part be alleviated given the release of the application last week. Given the go-ahead this summer to do what it takes to safely reopen schools in the fall, districts have purchased protective equipment and cleaning supplies, increased their technological capabilities, hired additional staff such as custodians, school nurses, and the highly coveted right now substitute teachers, and committed to providing childcare for their employees with their children while their children are in remote learning. They are just now able to submit for reimbursement for these expenses and have significant concerns about operating at a deficit leading up to an extraordinarily difficult budget season. As a secondary factor, in many cases, it is unclear to the field how to be proactive and supportive of the efforts to use federal funds to address the education funds shortfall, uh, though many have expressed um, a desire to do so. We respectfully request that the General Assembly proceed with its original plan for the $100 million, which we were set aside for K through 12 education to cover all of the costs associated with reopening schools. Given the collection of the CRF applications, they are well poised to estimate uh, for the General Assembly, the costs that schools have incurred. Above and beyond that, we imagine that as schools open, they will begin to realize that they what they couldn't anticipate in terms of safely reopening schools. So that's to say when September um, 9th comes around and the, the students begin to enter the schools, um, they don't know at this point what they don't know and that, that will kind of come to a head then. A change in course requiring local taxpayers to pick up the costs could disrupt reopening plans already in place. In particular, more systems may determine that it is safest to move in the direction of remote learning, which would have additional implications for the reopening of Vermont's economy. Um, all secretaries, French's testimony, local school district officials are very concerned about reductions in equalized pupil counts. A survey earlier this month by us indicates that with 46 superintendents responding, 85% are either very concerned or concerned about declines in enrollment in the current year due to COVID-19 uh, dynamics. As you're keenly aware, a decline in equalized pupils will translate in an increase in education spending per equalized pupil and increased tax, tax rates at the very time when schools need to both invest in learning opportunities for students and are contending with the economic effects of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. 
So just a couple other observations. Um, in an August 5th letter to the House and Senate Education Committees, the superintendent serving Vermont's three technical center school districts informed legislators that they had learned from the AOE that under current law, those districts are not eligible for federal relief funding. Since that letter, um, it was announced that this fund will be directed to career and technical education. Um, our associations believe strongly that the technical center school district should be granted sufficient funding for the reopening of schools through one of the available federal funding sources. Um, our associations have heard concerns from members that through tuition dollars paid by so-called choice districts in Vermont. We have not surveyed receiving districts about this concern, but we are hearing from school officials about anticipated revenue shortfalls in districts accustomed to receiving tuition revenues. So it might be something to look into as well. And again, as has already been discussed in this committee today, um, it has been reported that approximately 300 schools are interested in applying for the grant for the HVAC program, um, putting us over the original allocation for the project. Um, we agree that this is an essential component of reopening schools safely. Thanks very much. Oh, <coughs> thank you. I'll just note <coughs> that uh, the House has already drafted legislation around the Career Technical Center issue. And my assumption is that language will be coming to us and um, that'll be a vehicle that we will put all of this stuff on if it's not already on there. Um, questions for Chelsea Myers or Jay Nichols? Okay, oh, go ahead, Ruth. Thanks, I get, I, I think, um, Senator Bruth made a, a really important distinction um, that Secretary French and, and Chelsea, you also talked about the difference between opening costs and ongoing costs. And I think school districts are gonna have a lot of ongoing costs. And the, the focus has been on this, you know, what do we do to restart schools or reopen schools safely? And it's not gonna go away once kids get back in the building. And in fact, I think we're gonna start to see even more costs that we didn't know we were going to incur or issues that we need to address. Um, so I guess I would encourage all of us to think about what, what are schools gonna need for the fall uh, and even for the school year. Um, mm -hmm. But since we're dealing with CRF, it unfortunately has to be for the fall. Um, and you know that those ongoing costs for school school meals for sure, and hopefully we can address that. Um, but also with substitute costs, staffing costs, equipment costs, and all of that. Um, and making sure that we are able to address not just what they need on September 8th, but what they need on December 8th, potentially. Um, and I think you cover that in your, your testimony, but I thought that was an important mm -hmm. point that Senator Bruth made that we should just, under, I wanted to underscore about ongoing costs. And I see in the chat that um, Jay is gonna be sending the testimony to the secretary, so I, I think it's great. I know you all have been in dialogue all the way along. I think it's great if that continues. And now that we're back for four or five weeks, we would like to be part of those conversations and make sure that, um, you know, I, I don't see it as any great uh, stretch of the imagination to think that everybody's going to want to provide all of the funding necessary for K through 12 related to the emergency. If it's above the 50 million, which it seems likely that it will be, I'm imagining, Mr. Secretary, that the administration will support um, moving money to that. I heard you just saying it's too early yet to know whether that will be necessary. Um, so, you know, my hope is that the federal government gives us flexibility, but if they don't, we'll have to work with the Ed Fund in other ways, and that will leave a large chunk of the CRF money um, unexpended. So um, maybe that's a situation where, um, where the expectations of the superintendents and the principals can be met, and also the administration's desire to use that money in other places can also be met. Uh, you know, the, the governor's uh, economic development proposals, for instance. So all remains to be seen. Um, 
Any final questions or comments? We're at time. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. I know you have to leave. Uh, and thank you to Chelsea Myers and Jay Nichols um, and Brad James. And um, I will send you the Lemington email, Mr. Secretary, and I will email Jeanette White about the voting related parts of our discussion. And then I will see you all on Tuesday. Thank you very much for having us. Yeah, sure. See you all soon. Again, bye. Bye.